<laughs> All right, um, we're going to start on our next session. So we are currently running about five minutes late, um, but that is okay. Um, so our next speaker is Adam Toon from the University of Exeter, um, who will be speaking on lines, materials, and metaphors. Adam has worked on extended cognition in scientific context for a while, um, but this is something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to Liz and, and Mark and Matteo for having me. Um, it's really, really nice to, to be here. I think, I was trying to think back this morning, I think it's 10, 10 years ago, I think, I saw Andy give a, a talk in, in Cambridge, I think probably to mark the launch of Supersizing the Mind, and was very sort of inspired. And, um, and, and as Liz said, a lot of my work is in philosophy of science, so I was interested in sort of what the implications of extended cognition might be for things like what scientific understanding looks like when you think about science that's sort of dependent on models and diagrams and so on, what debates over empiricism uh, might look like if you think that its scientific instruments can extend our perception, that kind of thing. Um, today I'm, I'm going to do something slightly different. I want to go back to um, the, the central claim of, um, uh, of Andy's enormously influential paper written with, with David Chalmers on the extended mind. Um, and I want to talk about um, the conception of the, the nature of mental states that um, you find in that in that paper. So that the central um, claim, um, as many of you will know, is that mental states extend beyond brain and body into the world. Um, and although, of course, that, that claim has um, proved um, uh, influential and also seen as very radical and controversial, um, one of the striking features about the, the original paper um, is that the underlying conception of um, uh, the nature of mental states that you find there fits fairly comfortably with the kind of um, what's still probably the, the dominant view in the field, which I'll call representationalism. I'll say something, something more about that. Um, so, so even though the claim about where mental states are is quite radical, the, the view and the, the argument that's presented in that paper fits fairly comfortably with um, this dominant view of what, what mental states are. Um, now, in fact, I want to suggest that, um, that the extended mind thesis understood more broadly poses a challenge to representationalism. And the best way to respond to that is to abandon representationalism as a view about what mental states are and turn to what I'll call fictionalism. And it's a view I've, I've been trying to, to develop. Um, and that gives you a way of recognising what's really important in the extended mind thesis while avoiding some well-known problems or objections that people have, have raised. So that, in a sense, that sounds quite critical, but I have the, the feeling that um, so the, the fictionalist approach I'm going to push is sort of quite similar to Dan Dennett's work, for those of you who know that. And I have the feeling from reading some of Andy's other work that he may be broadly sympathetic to some of the things I want to say about um, uh, mental states are. Um, so perhaps I'm not sure if I'm disagreeing more with the Chalmers than in Clark and Chalmers or... Um, uh, so um, maybe that this should, should have, uh, appear at a conference on um, David Chalmers and his critics, but we'll see, um, we'll see what comes out. Comes out. Okay. So here's the, the plan. I'll, I'll very briefly introduce the, the extended mind thesis, say something about its um, relationship to representationalism, and then give a quick introduction to mental fictionalism as a kind of alternative approach to the nature of mental states, um, and try and show you how that allows you to rethink the relationship between um, minds and items of material um, culture, and try to run through some well-known objections to the extended mind thesis and convince you that you don't need to worry about them if you're a fictionist. So, um, okay. so here's the, um, the original infamous uh, example, which I'm sure many of you will know, but, but I will um, run through it anyway. So in the original um, paper, of course, to argue for this, um, this claim that mental states can extend beyond brain and body into the world, um, uh, Andy and David Chalmers give this example of Otto Inger. So Inger hears about an exhibition that sounds uh, interesting at the Museum of Modern Art. She thinks for a moment, um, remembers that it's on 53rd Street and sets off. And Otto is somebody who has memory loss. He carries this notebook around with him wherever he goes. Um, he looks the address up in his notebook and he sets off. And the claim is that um, uh, one way to understand the argument here is that the role of the notebook entries within Otto's life is... Um, sufficiently similar to the role of Inga's biological memory that um, uh, we can count the notebook as containing Otto's beliefs. Okay. So, so here's one, one way in which um, we find um, the, the moral presented. So Clark and Chalmers, you say, find the claim. The moral is that when it comes to belief, there's nothing sacred about skull and skin. What makes some information count as a belief is the role it plays, and there's no reason why the relevant role 
can be played only from inside the body. So you can see that in that way of presenting um, uh, this idea, um, that that way of presenting the extended mind thesis fits very nicely with representationalism. So what does representationalism say? Well, roughly speaking, that mental states should be understood as mental representations with a particular sort of causal role. So I wrote this example before Derby lost the playoff final to Aston Villa on, on Monday, but I left it there as a kind of poignant you know, uh, time stamp of this paper. Here. So, so if I believe on this view, right, I believe that Derby County will win promotion one day, um, then on this view, what it means for me to believe that, what, what it, um, uh, why is it that I, that I count as believing that? Well, I have a me mental representation with the content um, Derby County will win promotion, and that representation has got a particular kind of causal role. Right? So um, part of that is that it leads me to um, angrily cheer in support of Derby when I'm listening to them. If, on the other hand, I'd feared that Derby would win promotion, then that might have led me to cheer for Aston Villa instead. So, so beliefs, right, mental states in general, have these two features. They have a, we have a mental representation with a particular content, and it plays a particular sort of causal role in our cognitive machinery. And you can see, I hope, that, that um, the way, one way of presenting the extended mind story, the way that I just did with regard to um, Otto and his notebook, fits fairly comfortably with that. The argument proceeds by saying, look, we've got this entry in the notebook with this content that MoMA is on 53rd Street, and it plays the right kind of causal role to count as a belief. So, and that's why a number of representationalists, people like Tim Crane, have said that there's nothing that, that challenges the representationalist vision of the mind in this, in this argument. So, and, and there's a, a quote here that sort of um, fits that view very well. So, um, Parker Chalmers wrote, the information in the notebook functions just like the information constituting an ordinary non-occurrent belief. It just happens that this information lies beyond the skin. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to say, once we're sort of alive to the possibility of extended mental states, it seems to me that there are other examples that fit a lot less well with representationalism. So here's, a, here's an, an attempt. Right? Suppose you've got someone who's quite nervous um, and they find that using a stress ball helps them to um, cope with anxiety. I'm not sure stress balls are this effective, sadly, otherwise life would be a lot easier, but suppose they are. Right? So, um, so without the stress ball, he sort of feels anxious, he feels quite overwhelmed at work, he thinks, I've got to get a new job, you know, I've got to get out of here, I'm going to get the sack and so on. But luckily, having this stress ball to hand, he sort of manages to you know, he gets that pang of anxiety when he gets an email from Mr. Smith about the, the big account. Um, but with the stress ball, he manages to su suppress that pang of anxiety, he writes a reassuring email back to Mr. Smith. Colleague says, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, no, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, and, and so on. So, so, so using a device like this, say, um, uh, James can feel better. Um, he has all sorts of different kinds of beliefs, um, desires, intentions. He feels better, he thinks that the problem with the Smith account will probably be resolved, right? He thinks, yeah, I can cope with handling the new contract, I can do that, I, I can stay here, you know, in the company. The thought is, these kinds of cases are cases of extended mental states without representations that bear the content of those states. Right? So it seems to me that if James is behaving like this, it might be perfectly appropriate to say, um, uh, James thinks that the trouble with the Smith account will be resolved. And that thought might never explicitly occur to him. Right? It might, he, he, he thinks things are current. He has the current thoughts like, blimey, another email from Mr. Smith. Um, and, you know, someone asks him if, um, uh, if Smith email again and he cheerfully says, yeah, you know, and so on. The, the, the thought, this trouble will be resolved, never, we can assume, never explicitly occurs to him. And yet he might count, in virtue of his overall behaviour, as having that um, belief. Okay. So the thought is that there are some, I think there are other cases like this. Um, right, where we use something that's non-representational, that sufficiently inter interacting with it, sufficiently modifies our overall behaviour that we count as having new mental states, and yet there's no representation that bears the content of that, that state. Okay. Clothing might be another good example. You know, I can, wearing a sharp suit, I feel like you know, I count as having the belief that I'm going to get the job. Um, without the sharp suit on, I might not have had that belief, and yet it might never occur to me right, during the course of the interview. Okay, so... If you're sympathetic to examples like that, I think, you might think that there can be extended mental states without representations, either inside or outside the head, that bear those content. And if you're a representationalist, right, if you think that the aim of folk psychology, of attributions of belief, is to pick out representations with particular causal roles, 
then you might think there's a threat of the limitivism here in folk psychology. You might think, well, look, there are these cases in which our talk right, is not picking out representations with particular causal roles, and so perhaps that's, that talk's mistaken. And just as fictionalism right, is, a, is a way of avoiding a limitivism in other contexts, I think it can give you a way of avoiding it here. So what we should do in these cases, I want to say, is abandon representationalism and turn to a different view about what so folk psychology is doing. So here's, I have to be quite quick in, in introducing this, um, this kind of story about mental states. So the thought is that lots of our talk about the mind is ultimately metaphorical. Right? And I want to try and um, d develop that idea by drawing on a particular theory of metaphor um, by philosopher of art, Kendall Walton, right, that understands metaphor in terms of pretense. Right? And I think there's a way of understanding talk about the mind in terms of pretense that, that fits well with this, this story. And the upshot of this is going to be that the picture of the mind as a kind of inner world, what Ryle called the inner grotto view of the mind as a world of representations and so on, is a kind of useful fiction. It's there as part of our talk about the mind, of our ordinary talk about the mind, but we shouldn't take it too seriously. Right? It's a kind of metaphor. So here's, here's how the analysis of metaphor is supposed to work. Um, Walton gives this example. He says, suppose you say Crotone is on the arch of the Italian boot. Right? What are you doing? Well, you're not claiming, of course, that there is really a giant boot in the Mediterranean. He says, the way to understand this is in terms of pretense. There's a kind of common game of pretense that we all play where you pretend Italy's a boot. And when you say Crotone is on the arch of the, the boot, you're participating in that game and you're indicating that's the right way to pretend within the game. If you'd said Crotone is on the shoelaces, you would have been pretending in the wrong way. And, and so even though you're not, of course, saying there is a giant boot in the Mediterranean, you are making an assertion. Right? You're saying something about where Crotone is. You're saying it's on the south coast, right? in a particular position. And if you'd said Crotone is on the shoelaces, right, your pretense would have been inappropriate, and you'd be making an assertion that was false right, about where Crotone is. So the thought is that a, a metaphor people often describe as talking about a primary domain, in this case the geography of, of Italy, in terms of a secondary domain, right, boots, um, and the way that Walton's account works is to say, well, what you do is you pretend right, that something in your primary domain um, uh, has properties in the secondary domain, and in that game of pretense, you manage to say something about what you were the primary domain that you were talking about. You manage to say something about the geography of Italy by pretending within this game about boots. Okay. And I want to say you can analyse talk about the mind in a similar sort of way. So one way to introduce is to think about the, the famous myth that... Um, Wilfred Sellers comes up with talking about the origin of talk about mental states. So in this myth, there's a, a, a primitive society that, that has what Sellers calls a Rileyan language. So they only refer to avert bodily behaviour. So, you know, there's Adam's arm went up, but not Adam needed the toilet or wanted to ask a question or, or what have you. They don't have talk about mental states. And then along comes this visionary theorist right, called Jones in the story who says, well, you know, we can make sense of people by thinking they have inner episodes that are quite like episodes of overt speech, um, but they're inside the head. And they're like overt speech in that they have content, they have meaning, right? um, but of course there's no inner tongue that utters these sentences and so on. And he calls these things thoughts. And this is one way of understanding a kind of realist view, a representationist view of what's going on, right? that talk about the mind as an inner world, on this view mental representations come out of something like theoretical entities, like electrons things that we posit to make sense of observable behaviour. And the, the fictionalist f version of this myth goes a little bit differently. Right? On the fictionalist story, you start with the same kind of mythical society, but what Jones introduces is um, a useful metaphor. Right? So he's a little bit like the first person who thought it was useful to talk about Italy as a boot. Right? He introduces this useful game of pretense in which you imagine that people have these um, inner representations that work in certain sorts of ways. You pretend that people have these in the representations, um, but these things should just be seen as useful fictions. Now, um, in Seller's myths, so the focus here is on a current thoughts, right, and the model for that is overt speech, but of course there are lots of other um, public representations that we, that we use that have different sorts of, sorts of properties. Most obviously, written language right, hangs around longer typically than um, uh, spoken language and so on. 
And I think you can fill in this fictionalist story by saying there are all sorts of different metaphors borrowed from the world of material culture that we use to make sense of different aspects of human behaviour. And one of those is thinking about memory as if it were a kind of inner notebook. And one of the interesting things, if you take this kind of perspective, one of the interesting things about Clark and Chalmers' paper is that the, the kind of description they give of Otto is quite a nice description of that source metaphor for making sense of memory. Right? Our inner notebook is pretty trustworthy, and we have it with us all the time, and so on. We generally trust what it says. And talking about people as if they had these inner notebooks, right, as if their memory were a kind of notebook where they jot things down and refer to it later, is a very useful way of making sense of their behaviour. You can also think of things like um, you know, desires as a kind of inner shopping list, a wish list that we try and tick off. Um, uh, it having certain plans, like having a little itinerary plan of what you're going to do for the day and so on. Okay, so what's the rough idea here? Well, if you say on this view, Inga believes that Moma is on 53rd Street, this view you're making use of a kind of pretense. You're talking in a way that's fundamentally metaphorical. You're participating in this game of understanding memory um, as a notebook, right? and you're indicating that the way you pretend is appropriate within that game. And it's appropriate or inappropriate depending on Inga's behaviour. If she heard about that exhibition and went to 52nd Street, then your pretense wouldn't be appropriate. Right? It wouldn't be appropriate to pretend that she had an inner sentence saying 53rd Street. Right? So what you do is, I think, you make the, this pretense, roughly speaking, you're saying Inga behaves as if she had this written down in her inner notebook, right? even though you don't claim there are such representations in her head. Right? You're talking about a primary domain, Inga's um, uh, behaviour, in terms of a secondary domain, the human practice of using written um, language to, um, uh, to record things and act upon them. Okay. So in a sense, the basic move in this the fictionist position is, is almost exactly the opposite of what you might read into the, the Clark and Chalmers argument. Mm -hmm. So the extended mind thesis says, under certain circumstances, the mind can extend into the world because we can find external representations that play the right causal role. The fictionist says, well, all of our... Um, attributions of um, mental states are a kind of metaphorical projection inwards of the external world of material culture. So if you think that, you might think, well, can the fictionalist make sense of the notion of extended mental states? And I think fictionalism can make sense of that, and um, the interpretation it gives avoids certain problems, like I said. So I think the basic idea is, well, look, um, this metaphor, say, of memory as a notebook is something we use to make sense of people's behaviour. And we use it, and I think this is the really important insight behind um, the extended mind thesis, we use it to make sense of behaviour when people do rely on tools and when they don't. And we're fairly liberal with that. Right? So um, we can use it to make sense of Inga's behaviour when she doesn't rely on any external tools, but we might use it to make sense of Otto if he carried a map round which didn't have a list of addresses in it, but was some other form of representation, or if he carried a book of photos around with him, or even in cases where the external device isn't representational, like the stress ball, for example. So, that, the basic idea here is that what's happening in these cases is that we're using interaction with some external device to form a new pattern of behaviour, and in virtue of that pattern of behaviour, we count as having um, uh, new mental states. Okay. And I want to say that that helps us, that this way of thinking about the nature of mental states helps us to avoid some well-known objections to um, the extended mind thesis. So I'll try and run through those in the time I've got, got left. So here's one, one objection that's um, perhaps the most straightforward one, is just that this, the extended mind thesis has a real clash with common sense talk about, about the mind. Okay. So I just thought that it's just a kind of radical view. It's odds with our ordinary um, thoughts about the mind, and that counts against it. Okay. In fact, I think common sense is a bit more conflicted than that objection might make out. It seems to me we do attribute extended mental states in ordinary talk quite a lot. And, and David Houghton in an early paper gives lots of nice examples. So, you know, I go to Aldi, other supermarkets are available, you know, um, and I come back and I say, oh, I wanted to buy tomatoes. Right? And in that case, so, so here I have, you know, a list of things that I wanted to buy. And Houghton says, well, it's perfectly in line with ordinary talk that I say I wanted to buy tomatoes, even if I hadn't managed to memorise that internally. I just had it on a list. The list captures the intentions that I had, what I wanted to buy. And another example that I, I, I think um, 
um, we're fairly comfortable with is understanding. So it seems to me in lots of cases of understanding, particularly in something like scientific context, we'll attribute understanding to someone, even though we're perfectly well aware that they have to rely on diagrams and formulae and models and so on in order to be able to exhibit the required skills, um, and that that doesn't, that doesn't jar with ordinary talk about, about understanding. We don't, re we don't demand that someone uses their bare brain alone if they're trying to understand, say, some quantum phenomenon. But I think there is something jarring in, in ordinary talk about the mind in the extended mind claim. And this is something that Mike Wheeler brings up very nicely when he um, says, well, if we ask what he calls vehicle targeting questions, like where in space are the relevant cognitive states the architect realized? The architect's meant to be an example of ex extended intention where she intends to build such and such a building in virtue of having these, these plans. That that sounds odd, right? We kind of balk at that. Um, that question. And I think that's right, and fictionalism explains this kind of conflicted nature of ordinary talk about the mind. Right? We do attribute extended beliefs, but asking where they are, where beliefs are, is just a silly question. It's a category mistake in kind of old language. It's a question that pushes a metaphor too far. Right? It's like if someone says, oh, that guy's got such a chip on his shoulder, and you say, oh, really? Right or left shoulder? Right? It's just a silly question to ask because it pushes a metaphor too far. And if that's right, then I think this isn't a problem that's specific to the extended mind thesis. It's a problem with representationalism. Right? So think about this question. Is my belief that Edinburgh's in Scotland on the right or left side of my skull? Is it to the right or the left of my belief that Derby lost the playoff final on Monday? It seems to me that that's a silly question. Right? Just as a question of um, whether beliefs are located in an external tool is a silly question. Because it just pushes the metaphor, pushes our ordinary language games, it were, for talking about beliefs too far. Okay. So, so this, is, this is a case in which moving to fictionalism helps to deal with some um, worries that people have raised. Another worry has been about what cognitive science looks like if you adopt an extended mind perspective. Um, one way to put this is to say, well, look, when you look at, say, all the things in human life that support memory, right, extended memory, they're just such a motley of different things that we can't really expect any interesting scientific regularities that cover them. And so uh, Adams and Eisenhower give this big long list. There are notebooks, photo albums, file of faxes, iPhones, and so on. And, and in a response, an early response to this, Andy gives, kind of considers two responses. One is to say, well, there might be an overarching framework, like the framework of information storage, transformation, and transformation and retrieval that could cover that kind of motley. Just because you've got an un a motley of underlying causal processes doesn't mean there's not some framework that can cover them. But the example of the stress ball might indicate that the cases are even uh, broader than um, Adam's eyes hour imagined them to be. Another more dramatic response that, that Andy mentions, and I don't know if I put unpublished question mark because you mentioned a, a paper with, with Jesse that... Um, didn't get published, so I don't, I don't know if it has appeared since. But there's a kind of a thought, well, maybe the right response to this is to eliminate the mind. And there's a kind of radical response that says, well, partly what the extended mind thesis shows us is when you see this kind of motley of underlying processes, you, you, should, you should think that, quote, the realm of the mental is itself too disunified to count as a scientific kind. And the thought is that, that fictionalism gives you a kind of third way, unfashionable nowadays, third way option here, right, between these two alternatives, right? And that what's really happening in folk psychology is you're picking out patterns in behavior, as someone like Dennett might put it. And that's perfectly consistent with thinking there's an underlying motley of, of causal processes. Right? So Dennett has this well-known example. Jacques commits a murder in Trafalgar Square. Um, Sherlock apprehends him uh, for the crime. Tom reads about it in The Guardian. Boris reads about it in Pravda, is that how you pronounce it? And, and they all have this belief, right? They all believe that um, a Frenchman has committed murder in Trafalgar Square. And then it says, well, um, how likely is it, or need we assume that there's any kind of um, inner um, uh, uh, item that is structurally similar in all those cases, given their wildly different experience and behavior and so on? And it, the fictionalist shares that general intuition, and the extended mind cases give us lots more fodder for that intuition. So think about James and the stress ball again, and then imagine he has these different colleagues. Right? Jess is someone who relies on having a book of self-help mantras. He's got a kind of CBT therapy where she reminds herself that things have worked out all right in the past for her and so on and so on, that she relies upon. 
John's on antidepressants, and Jane, fortunately, is sufficiently confident to just do the job without any of these supports. Again, they might all share this belief, right, the trouble with the Smith account will be resolved, despite very different um, underlying uh, causal processes. Um, a third uh, worry here, which um, uh, has been pressed again by Adam Zahazawa, is that what the Extended Mind Thesis is guilty of ignoring um, a, a really important distinction concerning the nature of intentionality, the intentionality of um, the mental and the intentionality of public representation. So, and the background, of course, here is the representationalist picture of what of intentionality. So the thought is, well, public representations like language have only derived intentionality. They get their content from mental states. And on the representation of this picture, they get it ultimately from mental representations. And if we're not going to go around in a circle, we'll have to say that mental representations get their content in some other way, like um, uh, some kind of causal relations, evolutionary history. And the thought here is, well, then Otto's notebook doesn't count, right, can't count as mental because it doesn't have this property of um, uh, original intentionality. It's just derived. Now, there's a, a lot to say. I'm going to have to move quite quickly over this. There's a lot to say about what the fictionalist approach to intentionality is going to be, and I need to, I'm sure I'll need to do a lot of work to convince people. But roughly speaking, the fictionist is going to say, look, the intentionality of the mental is ultimately grounded not in any inner representation, but in behaviour. And sometimes that behaviour involves the use of public representations, right? like Inga says 53rd Street, and she means 53rd Street. So... So ultimately, the, the, the fictionist, I think, is going to have to say it's the intentionality of public representations, like language, that come first, and the kind of quasi-intentionality, the mental, follows on from that. Right? So the challenge for the fictionist is going to be to naturalise public representation, give a theory of meaning that doesn't require mental states. And that's a big challenge. In this context, the important point, I think, is it allows you to meet the worry that the extended mind thesis is somehow illegitimately taking an item of public representation and treating it as if it were a mental representation, blurring this distinction. Why? Because I think what's happening in an extended mind case is that someone's using an external device, which is sometimes representational and sometimes not, and by interacting with it, they're exhibiting a different pattern of behaviour. And it's in virtue of that pattern of behaviour that they count as having a certain belief. And it seems to me that I can't see that that is, is somehow... Um, overlooking this distinction between the public and uh, mental intentionality. Right? So one way to see that is to note that, strictly speaking, Otto believes that MoMA's on 53rd Street not because of the content of the entry in his notebook. Right? It's in virtue of the overall pattern of behaviour that he manages to display. Right? So one way to see that is to see, imagine that when he originally wrote down the addresses, he got them all one number out. Right? He wrote 52nd Street. And instead of going back and faffing around changing them all, he just thinks, oh, I'll remember to add one. And he can do that. In which case, it could be that the content of his mental state is moments on 53rd Street, but the content of the entry in the notebook is it's on 52nd Street. And the stress ball is an example where the external item doesn't have any representation, qua public representation. Um, okay, I'll be quick on this. So, so one, one, one last um, thought. The, the, one big worry, of course, of the extended mind is that extended mind thesis is that it, it has trouble drawing the boundaries of the mental. So, so one way to get into this, this worry is to see that an early objection was that um, Otto's notebook doesn't, in fact, play the same causal role as Inga's biological memory, um, because biological memory exhibits all sorts of properties like negative transfer, which is where if you have an old memory, say, of someone's phone number, um, it seems to interfere with your ability to form a new one. Right? I, I, all my mo phone number memories are like 10 years out of date, and I can never update them. I just can't, can't get around it. Um, so... And the worry is, well, if you think about those kind of properties, a notebook won't have them. Right? You can just rub out the old number and write a new one. Right? Now, a response, and I think it's a good response to that, is to say, but look, the folk, folk psychological notions don't include those kind of fine-grained features of, um, like negative transfer. Right? So, so one response is to say, well, we ought to specify this causal role that something has to have in order to count as a belief in a more coarse-grained, as it's put, way. But the worry, of course, is if you do that, you might go too far the other way. So you might get this problem that's often called cognitive bloat. Right? So what about, um, what about um, uh, my whole bookshelf in my office, many of which I must admit I've never actually read? Um, you know, what about the whole library of University of Exeter because I have the library card and so on and so forth? What about all the numbers on my telephone? 
So the, the challenge right here for the representationist is how do you individuate beliefs by specifying a causal role? And roughly speaking, I think the fictionist says, well, you don't. Right? You don't individuate beliefs by specifying a causal role. Right? That talk about beliefs has this feature of having a kind of central metaphor, for instance, me um, memory is a notebook. And of course, we know that metaphors can be apt, right, even if there are differences between the primary and secondary domain. Right? It doesn't trouble us if somebody says, you know, you can't really wear Italy as a boot, don't you? Right? So, so we're perfectly comfortable with the idea that what we're doing is relating two domains, not claiming that they're exactly alike. Um, and so, it's, no, so it's, it's not a problem right, to say that um, uh, there are some fine-grained differences, say, between biological memory and a notebook. But then you might worry that you've got the problem in the other direction. Right? When, where are we going to draw the line here? And it, this might seem like a dodge, but I think the right answer is to say there is no sharp line to be drawn. Right? The aptness of any metaphor is a matter of degree. Right? Think about the metaphor of the clouds are angry today. There are some cases where we'll all agree. Right? It's a storm. We all agree that the clouds are angry. There are other cases where we will all... Um, uh, agree on the other, hey, it's a warm, sunny day, and so on. And there are cases where we might disagree. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true about talk about the mind. And again, this isn't specific to extended mind cases. So here's a, a couple of examples. Suppose I've got extra libraries number stored on my mobile phone. Right? Do I count as believing it? Well, there are certain ways in which my behavior does match that um, uh, central metaphor. Right? I can come up with a number. There are certain ways in which it doesn't. Like if the phone battery's dead, I won't be able to give it to you. And so I think we might genuinely, in ordinary language, differ. Some people say, look, come on, you know the number. You, know? Um, you knew the number, why didn't you call? And I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, the battery was dead, I didn't know the number. Neither of those uses strike me as um, out of uh, accord with ordinary use of the term uh, no, or belief, and so on. It seems to me they're just using the metaphor for different purposes. And I think the same thing is true about purely internal cases. So suppose, as is true actually, um, I've imperfectly memorised my wife's phone number. Sometimes, in good conditions, I can tell it you. Lots of the time, unfortunately, if I'm tired or distracted, I can't. Similarly, I think ordinary usage goes either way. Come on, Adam, you should know it by now. Or, um, come on, you know the number, just think about it for a while. Right? Neither of those uses seem to me um, uh, to be entirely out of line. So that I think this, this case that the, the borderline is, is conflicted um, matches folk, folk talk fairly well. Okay, so uh, so tried to con convince you that if you um, you can defend the central idea behind the extended mind thesis well, if you shift away from the the view of mental states that um, uh, I've described as representationalism, that at least seems to be there implicitly in the original argument in, in Clark and Chalmers, and turn towards this fictionalist view, um, and on this view, the relationship between mind and materials will go both ways. Right? It'll be the case that. Lots of our talk about the mind borrows these metaphors from the world of material culture and we apply those metaphors to cases where we rely on material culture and where we don't.